Hello and welcome everyone to today's digital live event, New York State of Mind, Conversations on Real Estate and Innovation. My name is Ashkan Zandia, Chief Intelligence Officer and Global Head of Real Estate Tech Intelligence here at Cree Tech, and I'm excited to be your host today. We're excited to be partnering with Rebney in this limited virtual series covering critical topics in real estate. Rebney Tech gathers real estate experts on the premise of identifying the most pressing challenges in real estate and collectively assessing the existing technology landscape to serve as best in class technology solutions to those challenges. Rebney Tech builds relationships and breaks down knowledge silos between the real estate, venture capital, and startup communities to facilitate innovation. In a few minutes, we will hear from the most insightful and active leaders in real estate as we discuss work from work, re-entry and the future of the office, where we will learn what the near and long-term future of the office might look like from the perspective of leading commercial real estate stakeholders. Our discussion will shed light on how the office environment has been prepared to keep employees, tenants, and the greater public healthy as we all return to work. Looking ahead, we will get an inside look at how owners, managers, and tenants are collectively reimagining the office environment of tomorrow from the design and to the amenities, and of course, the technologies being offered. While we're waiting for everyone to take their digital seat, I'd like to quickly share with you um, a list of upcoming events we have scheduled with Rebney. Later this month on Tuesday, June 30th, we'll be hosting the part three of our New York State of Mind, CBRS, Connectivity and Technology Infrastructure. If you would like to use the power of Cretech to be featured in an exclusive co-produced webinar on a topic of your choice, please reach out to us by going to cretech.com slash contact. Um, throughout today's conversation, if you, our amazing audience and community, have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A button look at the bottom of your page. We'd like to hear from you, so please submit your questions early and often, and we'll do our best to answer them. And with that said, I see we have a large crowd already gathering, so let's just get the show on the road already. It's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel today. Our, our panel today will be led by Gaston Silva, Chief Operating Officer of Vernado Realty Trust. He'll be joined by Crystal Fisher, Managing Director at Fisher Brothers. Ed Pikinich, Chief Operating Officer at SL Green. Marianne Tai, CEO at CBRE. And Samantha Rudin, Senior Vice President of Rudin Management. Gaston, the digital stage is now yours. Thank you, Ash. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, I want to start by actually going off script for a, 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 just a minute. Uh, you know, after months and months of grim news, and which seems like a half a lifetime, uh, yesterday's uh, Supreme Court decision on LGBT uh, employment rights, uh, I find to be a breath of fresh air, uh, wonderful news. Uh, as wonderful as uh, to me was unexpected. So thank you for that. Uh, so let's begin. Um, I, I thought I'd begin by going through New York State's Department of Health guidelines very briefly. Uh, these are guidelines for commercial office management. It was issued on May 28th. Uh, and it's something that as we return to work, uh, conceivably as early as Monday in New York City, uh, we all need to be aware. So quickly, uh, the first thing that this guidance does is it describes responsible parties. Not surprising, responsible parties include landlords and property management teams, but also tenants. Each group has very specific, sometimes overlapping responsibilities. In terms of people, and this is the way it's broken down, and you can go on the, uh, on the state's website to find it, uh, we start with people, and obviously distancing is hugely important. Six feet distancing, you try to get that everywhere you can. Uh, we, we have to limit the size of gatherings as well as tenants. Um, uh, Non-essential amenities, and you know we've all grown accustomed to providing amenities to our tenants, uh, and tenants have grown accustomed to providing amen amenities to their employees. So a lot of these non-essential amenities are closed and should remain closed. 
uh, we, we are encouraged to stagger work hours. Uh, we are encouraged to continue working from home to the extent that people can work from home effectively. Um, uh, Non-essential visitors uh, uh, should not come into uh, the offices to visit people. Again, this is all from the, from the state's guidance. And uh, we are all supposed to designate areas for pickups and deliveries in the buildings. We'll get into some of these things in more detail shortly, uh, but let me continue going through this. Um, places, building systems in all of our buildings are relatively complex. The state has acknowledged that some buildings have closed for the duration and now we're gonna be reopening. Most of our buildings, certainly Ed's and mine's, and I, I know Fisher Brothers, uh, everybody's really who's on the, on the call, have remained open. Having said that, there are still things that we as landlords and building owners and managers need to do to prepare the buildings uh, to be reoccupied. Uh, obviously, the HVA systems, systems the elevators, uh, the water systems in the building, critically important, and we're all reminded that we need to take care of this. Even tenants, to the extent they have pantries, they have ice makers, they have equipment, all these things have to be looked at to create a, work, a safe work environment. Uh, the next uh, uh, thing in, with respect to places is protective, personal protective equipment. Uh, initially, the state encouraged us all to uh, wear face masks in public places. Uh, there's an executive order that's been passed by the governor that actually uh, allows us to refuse people entry into our buildings if they're not wa wearing face masks. Um, hygiene, um, cleaning is outlined to great detail. We've talked about all these things. This, this is nothing new. And I'm sure many of you are, are, are aware of this already, but obviously high touch uh, surfaces, restrooms, in cases there are confirmed cases in our buildings, there is additional cleaning that is mandated. Uh, there's communication that's required between tenants and landlords uh, so that everybody knows what's going on. And obviously the state is now very concerned about uh, contact tracing if somebody should get sick. Uh, phase reopening, we're very aware of this. We're waiting for phase two in New York City. Um, and developing and lines of communications have from the beginning been essential between landlords and tenants between tenants and their employees. Obviously, uh, th this is nothing new. This particular guidance ends with an affirmation that is required by the state of every employer. And it's, on, it's the last thing on the website for the state under this guidance, and uh, people need to be aware of that. Now, the process. Uh, we are all required to do mandatory screening uh, as employers. Um, we are required to do a health uh, screening uh, by virtue of questionnaire. It's a requirement. And um, uh, we as, an, as landlords are only supposed to do our own, um, uh, our own employees, but everybody is required to do this. There's an executive order which actually allows some landlords uh, to take temperatures of all people coming into our buildings. Some of us will do it, some of us won't. Uh, but the authorization, the authorization is actually there for all of us. Um, whenever somebody tests positive, whether it's on a questionnaire or a temperature check, uh, those individuals cannot be allowed to enter the building. This is obviously a very infectious disease. Uh, we've already gone through many, many months of this. We know how serious this is and we don't want to revert. We don't want to go backwards. Um, we all, uh, meaning all employers, need to notify the Department of Health if any of our employees have tested positive or have, or have become symptomatic. Um, again, contact tracing is very important, as is the OH notification. Now, all employers, tenants and landlords alike, have to have plans that are posted. Nobody is going to actually uh, look at them um, they don't have to be submitted, but they have to be posted. Uh, and we do know that the Department of Buildings has been going around checking work sites, and it would not surprise me uh, if they didn't start coming in and doing these inspections as well. Um, so that's the state guidance. 
Uh, lastly, uh, the Real Estate Board um, has put on their website and developed best practices for re-entering commercial buildings in phase two of New York forward. Um, thanks to Jim Whalen uh, and the rest of the great staff of the Real Estate Board and obviously Bill Rudin uh, for uh, making this possible and available and for running interference for all of us in this industry. This can all be incredibly confusing. Uh, it seems like things change from day to day and fortunately for all of us, they stay on top of it and keep us advised. Um, so now let's actually begin the program. Um, so Ed, I, I wonder uh, if you can lead us through what you see the return to work for look like in a typical New York office building. You're muted, Ed. Sorry about that. It's okay. okay. Thank you, Gaston. Um, so interesting, uh, I, it's been three, four months I've been here through the apex. Uh, keeping the construction sites going and I'll get to your uh, question, but it reminds me of, uh, as with many of you, I've been through a number of uh, crises through my career, everything ranging from the 1993 World Trade Center bombing uh, being 90 feet away from that, 9-11, then the Northeast blackout in 2003, the steam blast in 2007, and who could forget Superstorm Sandy 2012. Um, and here we are and it, although it's three, four months, it feels more like four years, but I think uh, being who we are um, as New Yorkers, uh, we're going to uh, prevail, right? There's a saying that uh, you never know what you have until it's gone. So a lot of the things we looked at in the past that we would have thought were uh, nuisance, uh, we're going to uh, learn how to get comfortable being uncomfortable, but I think that's just temporary. Uh, and that's just uh, something that'll just become protocol because as you said, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, following the rules and regs to protect ourselves from this, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, difficult challenge that we have. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's invisible uh, in a lot of respects. So, you know, for me, uh, it brought the quiet during that three, four month period, other than keeping the construction sites going because our buildings were down to 3% occupancy. Uh, the choir brought clarity for me and uh, allowed me to assemble my team and develop a steering committee to evaluate well over 100 line items, what we need to do to make sure that when the tenants come back into our buildings, that it feels normal. Uh, but again, that normal is going to be uncomfortable initially. So I'm going to try to walk you through real quickly, not each and every point, but you know what uh, they can expect when they literally come through the revolving door because that's where it all starts. Uh, we're really trying to focus on, uh, you know, contactless environment. Uh, and most people will forearm that uh, revolving door uh, as, they, as they come through. And, and they'll be greeted in our buildings with a trifold of many of the things that we sent out through a tenant guide. Uh, and to make sure some of the things that you've highlighted, everything from social distancing to proper uh, facial coverings to shielding, uh, and they'll be required to wear that shielding as we are here at SL Green as a tenant, but in the lobby or anywhere else in the building, uh, we're making sure that we enforce that by setting, you know, through example. Uh, the first uh, piece that you're going to notice and um, you know, what I think is key is we decided to invest in a uh, thermal scanner that is a little bit different than uh, other thermal scanners in that uh, it can handle about 100 people per minute. And we looked at the ones that, you know, you literally have to get in single file, uh, you know, which we found to be cumbersome. We wanted to make sure people can just walk through. And what that does for us is it literally scans uh, groups of 20, 30, 40, 50, up to 100. It's non-invasive, it's passive. Um, and we're looking to see anyone that, um, you know, hits that threshold of 100 point uh, four that was outlined by the executive order. Uh, our temperature accuracy is gonna be 0.3 uh, accurate. And if we do sense something uh, unusual, if uh, you're showing uh, some sort of high temperature, we will pull you to a secondary screening area. 
uh, to then discuss with you uh, what it could be, whether it, you, know, you just got off a bike ride, whether you just finished your workout, whether there's underlying conditions. We want to make sure that you know, we don't uh, you know, violate any discriminatory laws, so we're not keeping any data. There's no facial recognition on this. There's no, there's no uh, names associated with it, so uh, it totally respects uh, the law and make sure that you feel comfortable and our guards as well as our medics are going to be able to explain this to folks that are flowing in uh, through our buildings. Uh, and as you come in, uh, then it's life as usual. As much as we had card reader systems to get past our turnstiles, we decided to make an investment and um, have Bluetooth technology. So when you approach our turnstiles, if you're a visitor, uh, you'll be pre-registered. Uh, if you're a tenant in the building, uh, by the time we get through all our buildings, we will have the ability to get you through uh, by virtue of your phone. So, uh, you know, that too will, you know, take a little bit of time in terms of making sure people, you know, understand that they're, you know, they literally don't have to take their gloves off. If they have their phone on them, the phone will uh, sense them once they get within, within that zone. Uh, but back to uh, once you enter, you'll see uh, they're almost invisible. We, we put up glass partitions uh, by all the lobby desks. I call it a spit guard, but the reality of it is, is uh, it is a guard. We decided to also put it in our offices, but it all starts down in our lobby. We want to make sure if someone wants to approach a guard, they still can. Uh, it almost looks like a, a teller station, I guess, if you look closely, because you can exchange anything that you want. Uh, there's a little slot that's cut out. So um, if you have nothing to do with the guard, you approach a turnstile, you're heading in, there's signage, everything from reminding you uh, about washing your hands, disinfecting, um, making sure you understand where you're going to sit in uh, on the elevator. There's four spots. We evaluated each elevator cab, as we did with the um, lobby um, configuration, because each lobby was uh, completely different from um, unique in, 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 in their own ways, uh, different pinch points. And, you know, that all had to be evaluated to make sure that we can, you know, we can handle the crowd coming in. But you get into your uh, elevator cab, you've already seen that uh, you've had the hands-free experience, you've had the passive thermal experience, you're wearing your face covering. If you've got your face covering or you're bringing a gift, we will have extra face covering or hand sanitizers to hand out. Uh, with elevators, uh, I'm not going to kid you here, we, we stress over that. We thought that when everyone comes back, when we studied the algorithms of elevators, we, we thought we were going to have a backup. But I think in a lot of ways, uh, I personally don't see <clears throat> the, um, the increase in occupancy, and it has been increasing over the past uh, couple of weeks, uh, maybe reaching 50% in September. So I think the elevators are going to be more than sufficient to handle uh, the crowd coming in, you'll have your placement setting, you'll understand where you need to stand, and you're also going to see uh, a digital screen when you get into our elevator. So our Captivate screens will also still continue to flash hygiene signage uh, in addition to what you've already seen to make sure that uh, you have an understanding of how the law may have changed or if anything has, uh, um, you know, uh, um, if anything is, uh, you know, been um, loosened as far as, uh, you know, requirements. Uh, as far as uh, cleanliness and uh, enhancing hygiene, so you get out of the elevator, I'm going to try to hit the path I'm taking when I'm going up to my office. If I want to stop in the men's room or the ladies' room. Uh, the doors are latchless, uh, so when you push it, it will open from the inside. You could forearm it to open it up. And um, we, we, we struggled with a lot of different uh, products on the market as far as that's concerned to make sure that, um, you know, where we can make that environment before, you know, we get uh, uh, automatic door openers. I mean, I think that's something down the road, 6, 12, 18 months down the road for the industry to really evaluate how you do that. Uh, you know, right now it'll be through, um, you know, this um, elbow pull uh, that you're able to, um, Pull together. Now you walk into our offices, you're still Bluetooth. Um, and when you walk into our offices, we remind at least our employees, we decided to do it first. We, we've offered it to the tenants. If they wanted a cleaning service in addition to the regular cleaning service, which is uh, a disinfection and then a uh, uh, protection solution called Biotech. Um, I understand that I've been told, at least by the manufacturer, that you can actually uh, spray this on your food, but I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. I still have a tough time 
uh, you know, grabbing a glazed donut, let alone somebody spraying something on my food. But anyway, it's electrostatically charged. You, you uh, disinfect uh, the area and then you actually seal it. It's, uh, it covers porous and non-porous product uh, and it creates an invisible barrier that lasts uh, 30 to 60 days. Uh, and very similar, I, I, you know, I pass it up, you're going to see, uh, it's called Silver Guard in our elevator call buttons that uh, you can uh, clean, uh, but, in, but it's actually effective for 60 days. It has antimicrobial ingredients in the, uh, uh, in the product so that when you're hitting the button, um, you know, you have a level of comfort. And if you're wondering, does a tenant know that, we sent out a tenant guide to all our tenants with an acknowledgement um, that they received it and that they uh, passed it around. So if you are getting in the elevator and you think you see saran wrap over the elevator call buttons, as you look closer, you'll realize that it's Silver Guard and uh, uh, you know it's there for your uh, protection. Uh, deliveries are gonna be designated in the lobby as well. Nothing goes past the turnstiles and we're gonna make sure that any large food deliveries come through the freight elevator in the backside uh, and that everyone's uh, temperature is being taken. We already have been uh, doing that as a test. And, uh, you know, we've only had throughout our entire portfolio one incident where, um, you know, we had, a, a, you know, an elevated temperature. And, uh, you know, I often wonder what that uh, situation is going to be like. But um, this individual had 101 fever and, you know, respectfully uh, understood and, uh, you know, turned did a 180 and walked out the door. So uh, I think it's working, at least initially it is. Uh, we, we surveyed all our building uh, uh, enhancements in terms of uh, ventilation. We looked at our mechanical systems. We looked at each and every bathroom, tried to find out if we have supply, return, exhaust. And in those instances where we may not have supply or we didn't have uh, negative uh, air pressure, uh, we're going to be incorporating uh, HEPA vacs uh, in uh, HEPA uh, air filters, um, not VAX. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, once you uh, leave that area, every floor in our buildings is also going to be going through an indoor air quality. Uh, it's a wireless um, device that we decided to implement in all our tenant spaces as well as the uh, uh, you know, hallways so you can um, understand that, you know, we're going to be able to take a look at anything related to uh, humidity, uh, anything uh, in terms of uh, 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 VOC, uh, carbon dioxide, so on and so forth. Uh, and in those situations, uh, we're, we're always keeping a pulse on uh, occupancy, right? I'm walking you through this uh, whole process. And, you know, I mentioned that we have three to five to you know, now it's growing, it's up to about uh, 15, 16, 17% in some buildings. We have occupancy sensors at the entry and these additional uh, sensors to test the air, you know, will assist us in making sure that, you know, we're managing our uh, air infiltration. Uh, we're starting up all our systems a couple of hours earlier. Uh, and as simple as that sounds, when we went out to all our professionals, uh, there were different opinions across the board. And these are, you know, some of the leading engineers, MEP engineers that are out there. There are some that said, keep the system running all night. Uh, there are some that said, start it up just a few hours earlier in the morning. So even there, you have to make a decision as to, it, it, and it's not just about the running. We also looked at our filters and upgraded all our filters to make sure that, you know, we covered, you know, those important areas. But um, I, I guess the point here to take is that uh, the, it's not black and white in a lot of instances, and it's really, you know, the best of all the recommendations that some of the leaders in our industry, uh, you know, uh, provide. So contactless, you go to your cubicle, at least in an SL Green office, you go into your cubicle, and we offer this to our tenants, you go into a compartmentalized cube. Uh, there are uh, these plexiglass, uh, we actually switch to plexiglass when you're in our lobbies, it's actually a very thin glass, durable and uh, we, we still want that experience to continue in the office. You don't take off your mask until you're in your office. Uh, if you leave your office, you head into the ladies or the men's room, we ask that you put it on and all our conference rooms were equipped. And, and as we recommended to our tenants, we're practicing it. Uh, it's 50% capacity in our conference room. So how do you make sure that that happens? Hey, yeah, Ed, I a question came in actually regarding, speaking of tenants, a question came in actually regarding tenants. 
Um, and it came in actually pretty early. Um, and I'm going to put, bring two questions in together. Um, and it's, it's for you, um, at SL Green and everyone actually at our panel, um, including you, Gaston, um, with all of these new safety protocols, uh, we're, we're talking about work from work here, but you know, with all of these new safety protocols, do you think tenants actually will come back? I want to take that yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. Tenants will come back. It, it's a, you know, work is a culture. And if you want to be part of a team and a camaraderie, look, there's going to be work from home. And if that percentage, we could, you know, argue that point for an hour, two hours, three hours. Uh, the point is, is that people want to feel culture and you can't get culture working from home. Yeah. I personally think this is my belief, but there's a bunch of other people that specialize in this area. I take it personally. I'm very passionate about it. We studied what it's going to take to make you feel comfortable. And I said that that comfortable will be uncomfortable initially, but I want to come to work because this is where my team is. This is where I feel the culture. I can't, and I love Zoom, but I can't feel Zoom over the screen. I just can't. I hear you. Marianne, you represent some of the largest clients in Crystal and Samantha and Gaston. Some of the largest tenants, I dare to say the world, are, are tenants of your, are occupiers of your buildings. Um, what are you guys seeing on, on your end? Marianne, I'll start with you. How, how are your clients reacting to this, to this pandemic? The one uh, universal is that no one is going to force uh, their employees to come back. Um, what they're going to do, as Ed and Gaston talk about, is create an environment within the office space where they feel safe coming back. And I think that um, this will be, a, I think, a slow roll up uh, to full occupancy. I think, I don't remember, was it Gaston or Ed who said that we thought that we were going to see it right? Uh, to me, one of the great moments is our schools opening. Um, I think that that's going to be, there are certain pivot points we're going to see all throughout this process. I think it's very important uh, to keep the time frame in mind. People talk about everything like it's forever. And I think that as we go forward, I think we need to see that um, people will bit by bit adjust and then it will begin to fall away from us. But I think it will be a slow roll up to, to, to summarize. Yeah, Samantha, love to get your take on it. You, you, you operate your family, your your office management. For, you guys manage, you know. Um, first of all, I love your your project, your property uh, in Brooklyn. Phenomenal. We had our Cretech event there. It was a phenomenal location. But what are you guys seeing on your front? It's um, obviously it's not normal. But love to kind of get your perspective. And Crystal, same with you. Love to get your perspective on what you guys are seeing from your from your occupier clients. Yeah, so of course there are a lot of moving parts here and you know I think one of the goals is to inspire and ensure a, a feeling of safety and confidence as Ed said and there's obviously going to be these very, you know, clear protocols that everyone is going to have to follow. Um, so getting those in place, executing them well, having it be efficient. I know this is a tech webinar. Um, so, you know, having the technology in place to support and facilitate these protocols while we're in this uncomfortable phase. Um, our tech startup, uh, pre Prescriptive Data, developed an app, um, a mobile building app, and it'll do many of the things that Ed said. It'll be able to give real-time building updates. It'll also be able to allow for a contactless entry into the building. Um, It'll also show the occupancy in the lobby and the wait time so people will be able to, you know, plan their, their sequencing and timing. Um, and it also give the building health, you know, to, uh, show you what the air quality is. But I think also another key word is flexibility. And as people start to return back, and as Marianne said, you know, really, you know, no one's being forced, you know, to come back within our company, but we want to create circumstances and the dynamics so that people do feel safe and work. And it's, it, it's going to take time and everyone's going to have to be flexible and patient until everyone that, that comfort and confidence comes back. So. Crystal. Once upon a time, you know, about a hundred plus days ago, I think we were facing a pandemic. Right. And now we're facing, you know, 
in the United States, a pandemic amongst a racial epidemic amongst, you know, anxiety and a mayor in New York City and a governor that don't get along um, sometimes, right? And so I think that what we are trying to contend with here uh, is how to find a way to provide comfort. You know, what we, what we try to do at Fisher Brothers is communicate with our tenants in a way that understands their plan and supports them. And, and that's, the, that's what we've done for 100 plus years. And, and I'm grateful to be the fourth generation to carry that on and amongst a general manager who's third generation. And, and that's what we do, we talk, we talk a lot. Last night I talked until 12 a.m. And, and we're gonna talk again tonight. And, and so what does that mean? It means that we're facing childcare issues. It means that we're facing some concerns with people who have a little bit of fear about how they're gonna enter the building in the elevators. And so on a tech committee, what does that mean? It means that three days after we found out there was a pandemic, we realized we were not flow experts. And so we went out and we hired a flow expert and we did flow studies. Um, and I had no idea what that meant, very honestly, before this. I had never, I mean, we did a, a diagram of an elevator study in, in my tenure here, um, but it, it was not to this extent, right? It was not to mapping masses coming back in different staggered patterns, and that's just very honest, right? So we needed technology to provide mapping patterns and flow patterns of people coming back. So we relied on technology in order to provide a safe traffic pattern to keep people six feet apart, because at the time, six feet apart is what we had. Now we're understanding that maybe, maybe according to some regulations, if you wear a mask, maybe you can get a little bit closer. Potentially you could be three feet apart or, or maybe in some elevators, you know, you could do half the load. And so we're in a place now where we're using our best judgment and communicating with our tenants on a regular basis and our own employees to help them to ease back at their comfort level. You know, one of the things that uh, I think is on everybody's mind is how do you get to work, mm. right? Uh, we can provide spacing in our buildings. We can provide markers that are six feet apart. Yes, people will wear masks and maybe we'll get four or five or six people in, in an elevator, maybe. Uh, but if you draw a circle around one human being in an elevator, you get one person, generally speaking. <laughs> if you do that in a subway car, you get very few people. And then, you know, people have to get to work. Uh, I'm assuming everybody uh, on, on, on this program uh, is looking at bicycles and trying to figure out how to provide additional bicycle parking. Uh, we're looking at parking garages, taking over spaces. I'm assuming that's a general trend by everybody. Um, we talked about communications and communications with our tenants. And I've been very pleased uh, to find that many, many of our tenants are incredibly sophisticated. They develop their own apps for doing, you know, taking care of their responsibilities as employers with their teams. But I'm wondering if you guys like me are also finding a certain number of tenants who are like deer in headlights, which really concerns me, right? I think, I think Crystal touched on that uh, in terms of a constant uh, communication and exchange. I know with our employees, uh, you know, if we, if we look at the tenant, we, if we understand ourselves, uh, we're going to understand our tenants better. We, we looked at rotational schedules, which we've implemented. Uh, we put out a parking uh, subsidy policy. So if you want to drive in, we'll subsidize your parking. You know, not that the, this is the uh, be all and end all in these situations. You know, on the babysitting side, uh, we wanted to make sure that we offered that. But, you know, there might be parents that aren't too comfortable with that. So we subscribe to uh, city, sitter city and care.com and, and told them that we'll subsidize uh, daycare. So it's all those items. And I think Marianne touched on it as well, that we have to make sure we make them feel comfortable. And if we do that internally and have those discussions through our tenant reps that go out in the field and then talk to other tenants, it's just really by word of mouth that people start realizing that they have options. And if you give people options, and, and, and again, I'm not saying that it's uh, those are the, uh, the, the two that, 
describe it, we, we, we have to be flexible on dress code. We've heard from our employees that they don't want to see me dressed in a tie. I think someone, <laughs> what happened to the jean policy? Uh, but, uh, you know, all, all kidding aside, I, I think every panelist touched on, you know, the importance of making people feel comfortable. So those are just some of the things that I think, uh, you know, slowly but surely as people talk to each other, no differently than the way this disease uh, found its way and, and spread, that the word spreads that, you know, all these experiences, everything from entering to the hygiene, to the protocols, to the enhancements, to the elevator ride, every aspect of that tenant's experience is critical and we're keeping a close eye on it. So I think over time we're going to be able to perfect all those areas, Gaston. Yeah. Okay. okay. So Mary, Marianne, um, I, I want to uh, ask you about what this all means in terms of leasing, uh, leasing office space, and people's desire to be in New York and work in high-rise office buildings. So I, I'm going to give you a few bullet points, but I want to start with what are we doing to make our tenants comfortable? Um, on, on the tenant side, um, we have a, a, a division called Workplace Strategies. And typically what they've done is um, work with companies and envision how they're gonna occupy space. In the midst of the pandemic, uh, our customers reached out to us and not just our customers. For example, we just uh, we're in the process of doing this for the MTA's own office space right now, where Lenny Bedoin, my colleague Lenny Bedoin and his team all across the United States are actually interacting directly with uh, these companies and entities and making plans for them, what the space is gonna look like, what the protocols are going to be within their space, how they're going to access space, et cetera. So that's number one. Number two, um, I, I do want to say that I think this issue of how we get to work in New York is going to be one of the lasting contributions of this time. And I think that um, I've always said that one of the three ways you know if you're rich in New York is if you walk to work. Now I believe that but walk or bike or some personal mobility vehicle, you know, a uh, skateboard, whatever it is. If you can get to work that way, uh, and I want to point out that 27% of the people who office in downtown Manhattan walk to walk or bike to work. This is going to become a real buyer value on the part of tenants because the, the issue of ease of access is going to become increasingly recognized as something important and I think will be a lasting contribution at this period. And then I, just a comment about leasing, you know, Gaston, not a whole heck of a lot is happening. We were blessed to have our colleagues, and uh, I'm going to give a shout out to my three colleagues who did a fantastic job, uh, Sasha Zarba, Jeff Fisher, and Alice Fair in bringing us the TikTok deal, which as you all know, yes, exactly. Thank you, Crystal which as you all know, started before uh, the pandemic and closed after, and um, is about new jobs for New York. Well more than a thousand new jobs. So to me, that was an extraordinary vote of confidence and obviously a shout out to the nurses as well because they were fabulous counterparties. So I think we're still in the price discovery period with uh, our real estate right now, but I tell you what the biggest discovery period is for occupiers of space. It's how they're going to use the space going forward. Is there going to be a profound change as a result of what we've experienced? Or is it something less, um, um, less draconian and closer to where we are? Is there going to be significant work from home, uh, which we can have a whole conversation on. And by the way, I want to give Samantha credit on work from work. I love that. Um, she invented this and to me, uh, WFW is what I'm thinking about all the time, so. So Samantha, do you wanna expand a little bit on work from work? Sure, so uh, thank you, Marianne. And yes, uh, we are strong proponents of working from work because it works. Uh, you know, in, in our family, we're, we're a family business and you know, working together as a team is part of our DNA, in fact, our employees, to me at this point, they're basically family. And, you know, we truly value the principles of collaboration and coming together. And um, my great uncle Jack would say, if there's a problem, just get everyone in the room, get everyone in the same room and, and work it out, you know, figure out, uh, you know, solve the problems that way. And, you know, obviously there's been a very strong narrative that working from home 
uh, works, if that's what you believe. Um, but there have also been a lot of CEOs who have come out um, who have said it doesn't work and that, you know, it is really important to have that face to face and in person interactions to create, you know, these, you know, to, to have, uh, you know, successful successful uh, work happen. So I, I know, again, this is tech, but I did want to take a quick minute to give a little uh, English etymology lesson here. And if you were look up the word corporation, it comes from the Latin word corporare, which translates to combine in one body. And I will clarify that one step further. It does not mean to combine in one Zoom and one <laughs> Zoom call. It does not mean that. The word company comes from the old French word compagnie, which translates translates to society, friendship, body of soldiers, and in old Latin, it's companio, which is one who eats bread with you. So you you get the point. These words, colleague, colleague, all these words suggest the coming together. And I truly believe that if you do think working from home has been successful, it is, be, it is because of these pre-existing bonds that have been established from working you know, in an office in a shared space and creating that. And if you go farther and farther out and these bonds become unwoven, you really lose that connectivity and everything that makes, that makes business successful in the first place. And, I really think you risk you you really risk um, eroding at the culture and um, you know the success of business. So uh, very there you know obviously a lot of opinions, but we strongly believe in in working together in the office. Marianne, you're known for mentoring a lot of very successful people in New York City. So how do you mentor people on Zoom? How does that work? So, you know, you know, the, I, I think uh, that this work from home um, obsession, if you will, is already beginning to be tempered and will pass from us. Not, by the way, not that I don't uh, think that it is very useful to have this as a tool. I, I can tell you that some of my own colleagues um, uh, have arrangements with us, uh, uh, not uncommon, uh, that on Fridays, they work from home. I'm thinking of our friend, uh, Samantha, I'm looking at Samantha, Lauren Crowley, who we established this, I think when her second child was born, that this was a good way to, to work. But if you said to Lauren that your entire career is going to be spent working out of your lovely home, I think Lauren would be, uh, you know what, so long, I'll find an alternative. But let me go, let me go to something that um, has troubled me. Um, you know, we put a lot of emphasis, Crystal pointed out that this is a time not just of dealing with the pandemic, but a, a moment for us to look at uh, the racial issues that our country has faced and the diversity issues in general that we've seen in, in, in the workplace. Gaston, I don't know how you take uh, a workplace and truly make it equal and give equal opportunity for, to everyone if some people are working from home and some people are in the office. Um, I, I think that, I think the need, and, and Samantha's words uh, are so strong to me, uh, the, uh, the etymology of all those words, you know, touch is the first human sense that we all experience, right? And some might say the last as well. And I think that the idea of being remote makes it impossible to mentor in a deep, I think you can sustain relationships like this, but I don't think you can build them to the degree of depth if you've never actually been together, broken bread, had casual encounters, been in the room together. And I don't mean the Zoom room. By the way, I don't even like this for negotiation. I'm gonna say that right <laughs> off. Um, I think you need actually to be together because there are things that are completely imponderable. Um, one of my favorite things about, by the way, about meetings is to come out of them and think you're the only one who read the room in a certain way, and then to have the colleagues who were with you, right, report out that they, unspoken, but we all had the same exact reaction to something, or very similar reactions. Anyway, I don't mean to go on, but no, I don't think you can have true mentorship and build true diversity. Wonderful. Marianne, Asha, I know we have a lot of questions. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
If Marianne makes a really valid point about human connection though, and I think there are facts and figures that really tie, I mean, if you wanna look at our leasing in New York City right now it, it, and measure it, right? We, we talked about one deal here it was a great deal. My daughter Rose would be really happy because she loves TikTok, right? <laughs> but the point is, that's the deal we have to talk about because that, after that, when was the last time people were walking through space? Now we're trying to figure it out, right? We're using technology. We're right now, I mean, we've been piloting for the last six months, augmented reality, artificial reality, how to get this out, but now it's accelerated, right? This is the tech panel. We're trying to figure this out. We're using technologies to, to push this out to the community, and guess what? It doesn't replace somebody walking through your floor and seeing it in person. So, it, I mean, there is something, I mean, it's not, it's, it's a sensorial experience that they cannot be replicated any other way. And, and New York City leasing, I mean, is, is based in facts, figures, and financial bottom lines, right? I, I think the interesting thing about, uh, about technology at this moment is it sure has accelerated so many things. Virtual touring, as Crystal's pointed out, among them. I think it will have a lasting impact. I think we're all going to want to be able to conduct virtual tours of our spaces. I think what it might do, this is an optimistic thought, um, is that it might lower the number of, you know, how many uh, buildings you have to screen to get to the, the smaller number. But I'm with Crystal that at the, dis you know how you'll find out that somebody's serious? They're gonna wanna walk through the space. Mm -hmm. They show up. After they've filtered by way of the virtual tour process. Yeah, I, I just wanna jump in and say, cause I was thinking of this earlier in terms of, um, you know, we're clearly at a crossroads right now where where everything is in our face, the things that either in the past we thought were working, now we're not able to really do them the same way, or we're clear that we have to make changes and that we can't continue going on in the same way that we were, were going. And so I think, again, it's using the technology right now to help facilitate us, help aid us to move forward, to make these choices that need to be made, you know, to help move forward humanity, but not replace it. And so it's walking that fine line. Absolutely. Very well said. You, know, Ash, long, you want to ask um, some questions? If I could just Sorry, yeah. on what Sam said, uh, I think it's interesting. You know, when I look at the DOB permits, uh, they spiked up 164% uh, as of 6-6. Six, six, and construction sites are back up and running. Uh, DOB is functioning well, and it's critical to the process. And you know, developers are starting to feel that there's a sense of normalcy. I walked a lot of these job sites during the apex. It felt like there was a nuclear warhead that hit here in New York City. I would, I would come down Park Avenue and there would be people laying on an intersection. I would stop because, uh, you know, I thought it was a dead body. Uh, and I rolled over and rolled up and said, are you okay? He says, I'm just enjoying the view. Laying down the middle of an intersection. So you can't do that today. Cars out there. There's a buzz out there. There was there was a couple of guys, and it's on YouTube, and you could see it. They were driving guy, golf balls up Madison Avenue. You know, those <laughs> days are over. They'll never happen again. And I think everything is heading back to where it uh, where it was. And I am going to uh, share this because uh, Samantha, you motivated me. Culture. I looked up the origin of culture. Okay, so it comes from the word colere, uh, from the French term. And it means to grow and cultivate and nurture. And we're cultivating and nurturing our city to come back. And it really has, I mean, I feel it. I know it's coming back. I'm excited about it. You see it in the numbers. It's slow. It's not as quick as we all like it to be. But, um, you know, I'd love some of the comparison all you ladies made. Ash, you want to run some of the questions through some of the questions? Absolutely. I don't have any linguistics to share, but... Um, <laughs> oh, come on, Ash. <laughs> I, I can do it for you in Farsi if you like, but uh, that's the extent of it. Um, actually, a lot of great questions came in from our audience. And, and Samantha, to kind of pick up on your theme of technology and innovation, by the way, all these questions are, are for the entire panel. They're not, they're not pointed at anybody. So feel free to jump in. Um, uh, on the, don't, let, don't, let, don't make me point and, and, and click on you, please. Um, 
a question came in. Um, I've noticed that landlords are investing in tech and new office startups. Do you think the acceleration of innovation is a good thing? Do you think that it's overinflated because of owners investing in technology? Um, I know a few of us on this panel um, have invested in tech or our companies have invested in tech or we have um, co-working like facilities uh, that we, uh, we operate um, or we invested in co-working. Love to kind of throw it up there. What is your take on, on techno technological innovation in the built world and in real estate tech? So I, I'll start there and then, then you know, I'll, I'll back up because I know that there are other panelists who have co-working facilities. Um, you know, I, I think that the idea you asked, is it overinflated, right? Mm -hmm. um, technology is very much the future of what we're doing in the world, right? We sat on this panel before COVID happened. And, and so, you know, much of what we've implemented within our portfolio was also happening before the pandemic. So for example, UV light technology in our HVAC system, we were piloting that a year before this happened and actually installed it six months before it happened. And so, it, you know, it, it's, God forbid, you know, we had this, we didn't want the foresight to know this would happen. We were doing this for mold. You know, it was, it was for VOCs. It was to be proactive landlords because that's our responsibility. And then, you know, something that came out of this technology advancement, we found out, you know, as, as an as a overarching product of technology because there are other things that technology provides, which is why we sit on this panel, which is why we're tech members, which is why we're participants in the future of innovation. You know, because there are other advancements that come out of being relevant and caring, right? Um, it just so happens UV light technology and photo hydro ionization, right? The big supercalifragilistic word of the day uh, that we installed in our building, you know, which we've now rolled out in the rest of our portfolio and will be done by the end of the summer. It just so happens that it also has the ability to kill up to 99% of viral pathogens. Fantastic. But that's a part of being a really relevant and caring tech community member. So overinflated, I'm not sure that that's, you know, that's a fair word. I think responsible and doing your homework, piloting, beta testing, and not rolling out too quickly that's the that's a job of a responsible and caring property management team landlord and and ownership also could you imagine if this happened 30 years ago and we didn't have this technology i know we all or some of us don't love it but what would we have done if we didn't have it i mean that would have been a real disaster i mean really not good so again, it's really important to keep us moving forward and, and really as, you know, to help us through when we do face these challenges, because again, we weren't prepared for this pandemic and to think that, that, that something else couldn't come happen down the road would now obviously be silly. So to constantly be innovating, updating, being prepared, that's our responsibility. And if we don't learn that lesson now, um, not quite sure, uh, what we're going to do. Also, the fact that my uh, seven-year-old daughter now is able to Zoom on her own and text me, those were not things that I was expecting at such an early age, but it's, it's actually quite amazing, um, uh, the advancements and even for these children, how much they're learning. Can I pick up on what Samantha just said? Uh, and Crystal, uh, one of the things that's been interesting to me in terms of technology at this moment is watching technologies that were developed for other purposes um, now apply themselves to the office space. For example, um, I, you know that app Clear that some of us have used at airports uh, uh, for uh, getting through security or if you go to a Knicks game or a Live Nation concert or whatever. Now Clear has taken their sort of bio, not sort of, their biometric uh, approach and are beginning to apply it to office space. 
So at 1740 Broadway, a building that uh, we're uh, working with uh, um, uh, Equity Office, uh, the Blackstone folks, we're gonna be using clear as the way to get uh, tenants into the building. Well, how wonderful to think that we're gonna find a way out of the cumbersome world that was created post 9-11, where we can have our people flowing in and out of a building without necessarily having to make the stop or get their cards out or et cetera. Um, there are so many things that, that are being accelerated at this moment. I was thinking of another Silverstein um, technology investment, uh, something called Dojo. I don't know if you know that at all. Um, here's a case where um, the management of people in the office, working from home, et cetera, is gonna be an incredibly complicated set of decisions to make and to orchestrate. Here's a technology that enables you to do it. So I think that the problems created actually have also enabled us to be, you know, real estate has never liked change, right? It's a brick and mortar uh, business that really relies on a very long-term view. Um, this has really forced all of us to embrace things uh, sooner and to experiment. I 100% agree. And, I, and, and to that gentleman's question regarding um, inflation, overinflated, whatever, I think uh, to help answer that on the venture capital side, um, total venture capital investments surpassed 3.8 billion over the past uh, 60 days um, out of 73 deals. And the vast majority of those startups or those real estate technology companies were in business productivity. And so on our side from a Cretex, there's absolutely no, it's not overinflated. I, I think it's right on par because keep in mind, real estate tech was really a subcategory of fintech in, in the early innings. And right. so now what we're seeing is this re, repositioning of real estate um, and then doubling down on investing in technology that drive clear ROI, clear NOI for real estate owner operators and managers and brokers and others. So uh, on the venture capital side, no, not, not at all. Um, on behalf of tenant amenities, so th this is a, an interesting question. Um, this person asked basically three different questions at three different times. I'm gonna merge them into one. Um, landlords are, are, are large institutional owners are, are known for uh, investing heavily in amenities. However, with the current pandemic and a handful of owners uh, having vacant space, do you foresee owners repositioning their assets just like RxR planned on doing before the pandemic. I'm assuming he's referring to the uh, co-living, co-working model that um, Scott was trying to put together. Um, but more or less, do you see a repositioning of assets because of the pandemic or do you think owners are, will, re, uh, will adjust their new normal? So, I'll start again and then anyone can go, you know, I, I think that the reality is, is this is a reallocation of space question first, mm -hmm. and then it's what happens after, right? So if you look at, you know, we have premier exclusive agents that work with us. And, and so we've, I've read too many studies to, to sort of, you know, keep all of them in line with, uh, and I'm not sharing with you who this one's from, but here's the reality. The point is, when you break it down, people are gonna socially distance, right? Mm -hmm. So if you socially distance within space and people start to stagger and work from home, somewhere in the middle, you end up taking the same amount of space. Actually, the equation that we get down to is about a 2% differential, still the same floor plate, according to our exclusive brokers, and this is multiple exclusive brokers that we're working with, and they're fairly reputable, and it's pretty accurate information. So I'm going to take it for what it's worth. Now you can take my word or not, and you can go do your own homework and that's fair. But the idea is that if, if some population, approximately 15% stay home and then the rest stay at work and you put them six feet apart, you end up with 98% of the population on the floor distanced apart. Okay. As landlord X, I'm assuming that my floor plate is going to be leased as soon as people can come to my floor plate. So we're ramping up and preparing. Our brokerage team is doing virtual tours to send it out so that people can start seeing it. And hopefully within the next few days, they're walking through the space. 
On the back side of that, you'll see over my shoulder, we have a director of hospitality, we have a concierge team that is already and was before this pre-COVID building a team and suite of concierge services because that's part of being a relevant landlord, we believe. And, and I don't think that we're alone in this. I think everyone on this panel mm -hmm. understands what it is to service a tenant base in today's market. The demographic is demanding a little bit more and that's okay. So how do we adjust to that? According to the guidelines that Gaston talked about earlier, in those spaces, when we're allowed to use them, we're probably gonna have to space them by 50%. And we're probably gonna have to make sure that they're cleaned a little bit better. They're all gonna be hosted on an app for our sake. And on our app, we're gonna be able to see when they were clean last, how many people will visit them, and they're gonna allow people to come through the space on Bluetooth, you know, is touch-free experience through our castle system so that everything is seamless and through one space. But, you know, I think the idea is full integration through a tech-based platform, making it easy and seamless, but with the reality that people are still taking a footprint within your space. It was a lot in one answer, sorry. <laughs> can, I, can I just say part of the uh, buyer values of tenants today are uh, include amenities. And by the way, you can do a building as we did 1271 Avenue in the Americas with no in-house amenities if you're in a neighborhood that in the immediate neighborhood is amenity rich. Obviously Rockefeller Center, um, you know, was amenity rich enough that we didn't have to put them within 1271. But the truth is that this is what uh, um, tenants know that the people who come to work for them um, are, looking at the workplace environment beyond just where do I sit? They're looking at the full complement of what's offered in the space. And even though we have issues today with social distancing, et cetera, this is in the scheme of, of, of time, a very small period. Those amenities are still going to apply and they're gonna to continue to morph over time into to, uh, to different types of things. Um, but I think they're, they're here to stay with us. I, I agree and I just want to jump in quickly because I think you know one of obviously the issues that we all know very personally about being in New York City is that we're all on top of each other and that's made this whole situation worse so that density so social distancing and I do think spacing out obviously that's going to be you know taking more space people wanting to have more space you know latest the latest studies show that the virus has a, a much harder time existing outside. So having spaces, having offices that have outdoor space. And I think that there's gonna be a movement towards, you know, there's, it was already there, but even more in terms of wellness and health. And we know that like one of the ways to prevent catch, you know, getting sick is that to, to strengthen our immune system. So healthy, healthy, you know, experiences a shameless plug, come to Doc 72. We have lots of indoor, outdoor space, recreational facilities. So again, we were already going there and this will probably even accelerate that because once the, the, the bandages come off, it's gonna become clear. People will wanna live, they'll wanna work and they'll wanna live and work well. Yep, I 100% agree. I see that we're, uh, we're coming up um, towards the end here. One end on a positive note, quick round table. Obviously, there's a lot of positive that's coming out of this, but I'd love to get everyone's opinion, starting with you, Gaston, and, and kind of going around the table. What is one positive takeaway um, that, that, that you're taking away from, from this pandemic? Uh, I think that we all miss working together. Yeah. Yes. Basically. Yeah, Ed, feel free to jump in. I, uh, I'm gonna say, Early on, I highlighted the emergencies I've been involved in, uh, the crises, I, I referenced them. I'm gonna say that for everyone, uh, we experience this as some of our darkest moments, but it's, it's those moments, I think, that strengthen us and push our boundaries. I, I mentioned how, you know, the quiet uh, in the last three, four months, when I talk about clarity, I think it was me, Mark Holiday, and one or two other people in the office, no one else every day, and we're staring at each other, wondering whether we were doing the right thing. Uh, so I'm gonna say that pushing those boundaries is the bridge that's gonna get us back to um, you know, where, uh, where we belong. If, you know, if you think of 
when 9-11 happened, and I don't want to mention these other crises, uh, there was a advertising executive that, uh, you know, came out with the saying, if you see something, say something. It was born in 2001. And it was 9-11 that, you know, they realized, you know, let's, you know, let's use this uh, as a tagline. And in 2002, there were 814 calls on uh, suspicious packages. The following year, 37,000. And the reason I mention that is that, you know, it's an avalanche, right? And everyone knows that saying. And I think here, you know, for us, this emergency, we're going to look back and we're going to realize how much more we learn, how much more we measure, how much how much more convenient we actually do make it. So, I, you know, I believe it's going to make us strong. Sorry for that long answer. No, I, I appreciate it. And, and, and speak about Mark, I love reading his quotes on Instagram. So keep them coming, please. Uh, I will. Uh, yeah. I think the, the, last, the last part is, is our civic duty. Uh, what I want to make sure that everyone knows, you know, during this uh, uh, pandemic, one of the things that, uh, you know, I have to credit to Mark here is that uh, we've handed out almost 200,000 meals. We, as a company, SL Green, donated a million dollars and uh, partnered up with uh, 19 hospitals, 12 restaurants, and uh, being able to pull that off uh, at a time when, you know, we were uncertain, but really extending uh, out to the community, all those that were unemployed and hungry and, you know, uh, suffering from poverty. Uh, you know, I just want to put it out there. If you want to visit our uh, website, Food First, that's all great. Absolutely. That's very beautifully put. Uh, Marianne, Crystal, Samantha, I'd love to get your perspective. One positive takeaway from this. Just to say the thing that this moment has made so clear how all New Yorkers are connected to one another, whether it's the essential workers, whether it's the walk into a, a restaurant again and see how you feel, whether it's the Broadway plays you can't go to, we are all really one community. And all of us rely on one another in many different ways. And I think that New York City should emerge from this moment with an appreciation for all of its people. Yeah, I agree. I said I've never felt farther apart from people at this time or closer. And I think we've all sort of, you know, through the, you know, uh, it's just been all the challenges we've all, I think, in a way, bonded and connected and, and really, you know, just learned not to take anything for granted. And I think a, a big takeaway is just kindness. My mom always talks about it. And, you know, that's what we all need in every moment, especially when we're going back out there and there's certain fears or just, just be kind to yourself and to those around you. It's all that really matters right now. And dovetailing off that, I mean, we can truly do anything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have survived quite a bit as New Yorkers. We've grown up through it. We continue to do it. We adapt, we change, and we do it quickly. You know, and, and I, I want to say I've been here through the majority of it. I've taken a couple days out of the city uh, as a, you know, quick respite in the car. But the reality is the highlight of my day has been through all of this, the 7 p.m. cheer. And I was sad to see that 7 p.m. is starting to fade away, right? But that means that we are starting to come back and we can do this. We can do whatever comes in front of us because we're doing it together. We're doing it talking to our tenants, talking to each other, talking through Revney, talking through organizations. That's what New Yorkers do. Maybe we talk too much, but we do it really well, right? And we will pull through this. Uh, very beautifully said. Thank you yep. so much. Um, so that's all the time that we have for today's conversation. I really wish we had another hour dedicated to this. I could hear you guys talk forever. Uh, on a very personal level, I just want to say I really appreciate the time everyone has taken. I know everyone's focused inward right now on getting the city back up and running. So taking the hour to, to be here today really means a lot to me, our community, and of course, Cree Tech. Um, so thank you all very, very much. Um, Gaston, Marianne, Ed, Crystal, Samantha, thank you for sharing your thought leadership. And thank you to Revney the Real Estate Board of New York. I hope everyone included, including our amazing audience and community had a great time because I absolutely certainly did. I'm a huge fan of everyone on this panel. Um, if you would like to use the power of Cretech to be featured in a, an exclusive co-produced webinar on a topic of your choice to showcase your company's expertise, 
please email me at ash, that's A-S-H, at CREtech.com or by going to CreeTech.com. Again, my name is Ash Gonzandi. It was a pleasure to be your host today. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Thank you, Ash. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.